Can't you just feel it? The conflict is becoming apparent in our culture. It reminds me of those words of John Paul II. We're now living in the final confrontation between the gospel and the anti-gospel, between the church and the anti-church, between Christ and the antichrist. And if we don't choose to know God's word, to believe God's word, to follow God's word, we're going to be a sitting duck for all kinds of confusion, all kinds of disorder. Those are really important choices that people have to make. And these choices are difficult. Who am I going to marry? What kind of life am I going to live? How am I going to raise my kids? What am I going to do with my time, my talent, and my treasure? And I have to make a choice today. Jesus says to each one of us, I came that you might have life and have it to the full. The question is, do we want it? Welcome to another week of The Choices We Face. I'm Peter Herbeck, and I'm delighted to be able to introduce a very special guest today, Anna Carter. Anna is co-founder and president of Eden Invitation, which is really a movement of Catholic young adults who are experiencing same-sex desires and gender discordance. And they're trying to, and they're building community, they're supporting each other, they're, they're producing excellent teaching and trying to create a place for folks who are in the middle of that. And we know in our culture, lots of folks are in the middle of that. So the church is, uh, we need good leadership in the church on this and good shepherding and lots of love. And Anna and her team are doing just that. Welcome, Anna. Thank you. It's good to be here. Yes, yes, yes. Well, there's a lot of different questions I like to ask, but why don't we just first talk about your whole story, your whole journey and how you got from here, you know, from there to here. Yeah, absolutely. So I uh, was raised Catholic uh, and from a pretty young age had an encounter with Christ in the Eucharist and adoration, you know, youth group kid and really fell in love with Christ. And just I have a very, I don't know, all in kind of personality. So that was it. That was going to be my life. I was going to do youth ministry and all of this stuff. And then also when I was in high school, I started recognizing like, I have feelings for my female friends. Like the way I'm feeling about them is ways they're talking about boys. And I don't really know how to reconcile this with what I'm experiencing in my life of faith. So for me personally, I just kind of stuffed those feelings. I stuffed those experiences. Um, didn't really look at them and just kind of kept going <laughs> in life. And I ended up uh, getting going to Franciscan for, you know, catechetics and theology, served with net ministries. And really like through that whole period of deepening in faith, I think, you know, the more that we're growing closer to Christ, I think the more, the more we're trying to open our hearts to him, the more he's looking right back at us and looking right back at our hearts and saying, hey, I think we need to take a look at this. Mm -hmm. You know, I think we need to take a look at this part of your life. Um, you know, there were, just relationships that I was developing or kind of fallen into that just were not, um, were not great, one could say. Yeah. <laughs> and so really the, the Lord kind of opened that part of my heart up to say, like, we need to, we need to talk about this. And so I, I started um, surrendering that more to the Lord and just saying, hey, what is, what's going on in my life, right? What's going on in my heart here? And opening up with friends and with mentors. And so really for me, my experience of, you know, same-sex desires kind of ran like concurrently with, you know, just being Catholic and, and my relationship with God. And I think more often than not, it's been actually a catalyst for deeper faith and encounter with him as the lover of my soul, ultimately. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, I, I didn't know, I wasn't always public about this part of my experience. I, you know, worked, um, was a Catholic high school teacher and campus minister. Uh, and then there was a period about five years ago where I was just discerning like, God, what's, what's next in my life? And it felt like this was an area that he um, was inviting me into a, a deeper mode of like discipleship and leadership, I guess. And yeah. now here's Eden invitation. <laughs> was um, when you were in, in the high school years, you're beginning mm -hmm. to experience it. Were you having any conversations with anybody at that point? What was it like just for you to walk through it and experience it? You know, it was actually really challenging. Um, it was around the time that the first wave of sex abuse crisis was breaking in the church. And so the temperature in the church was pretty hot on this topic. Uh, and the language was pretty intense. And I was just a 15-year-old trying to figure out my life. And I was a little afraid 
frankly, to talk about it in the church. But I also knew I didn't really like the narrative that was going on in culture either. At the, you know, I was like, no, I want to follow Jesus. Like, I don't want to leave the church. I don't want to live this lifestyle. So I kind of felt torn. I didn't really know where to go as a young person. I didn't always feel like I could talk about it in the church, but I also knew I didn't want what the culture was offering either. Uh, high school kids, especially, I think high school girls are very conscious about their friendships. You know what I mean? And and was it a uh, mm-hmm. challenge to to say, should I let my friends know about what I'm experiencing or should I just keep it quiet? Are people going to think I'm strange and weird and I'm going to lose friends and it's going to be a big deal. I don't want it to be a big deal. You know what I mean? What was mm-hmm. that? Can I ask what that was like in terms of your relationships with peers at the time and yeah. the struggle? You know, and I think it was different than it is today. You know, I think now it's almost more more accept it's definitely more accepted today to share these things but I think at the time you know in the 90s early 2000s very much so it was like I I'm not going to tell anyone this because I'm worried they'll think I'm attracted to them and will this affect our relationship so it really wasn't until college when I already had really an established you know sisterhood right I had an established group of friends um where vulnerability and accountability was the norm uh in that Catholic setting, that's when I started talking about it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, Since we're talking about high school age, uh, do you have any words you could say to any high school kids who might be listening in terms of might be thinking and feeling some of the very same things that that you were thinking and feeling at that time of where they can get help, what they could do, where, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I guess my my advice to a young person would be uh, just keep praying and keep living. You know, I, I think it's, uh, it's a challenging time of life to feel like you have to figure everything out right now, right? You have to you have to make a decision uh, to, you know, label yourself a certain way or see yourself a certain way. Um, when in reality, I think all of our all of our emotions, all of our feelings are really complicated. Um, and so, to keep you know talking to God about this, uh, to keep telling trusted people, you know, being open about what you're experiencing, um, and just keep trying to live like the whole of your life, right? Your experiences of sexuality, your experiences of gender are very real, um, but your life is complex and really beautiful. And so to keep uh, really looking for ways to shape yourself as a whole person right now, whatever age you are. Yeah, very good. Thank you. The Eden Invitation, where'd you get the name? Like what is, what is the name has meaning, I'm sure. What does it mean? It does. Yeah. You know, I think it's um, really, it's our approach and our posture, right? I think with Eden, uh, we, I really see, I think a lot of conversation around sexuality in particular kind of hyper focuses on what to do or don't do in the sexual act, but that doesn't tell me how to live the whole of my life. And so we really try to, you know, pan the camera back to say, what does it mean to be human, right? What is it, what's God's invitation to us as human beings? Uh, and then also, what is our posture towards others? You know, we um, we really try to invite other people, right? That's what Jesus did. You know, you see that in the earliest parts of the Gospels, right? The the apostles, the would-be apostles, um, are tracking Jesus down. And he says, just, you know, come and see. Come and see. Um, and that's really the posture we try to adopt. Because uh, there's a lot of, I think, pretty strong voices, loud voices, demanding voices in our world today. And, and we don't want to just add to that. We want to be gentle in our approach and say, just come sit with us. Yeah. Come have a meal. Come and see. One of the, one of the, some of the things you hear regular people talking about broadly in the culture, I'm living by my truth, not just in this space, but in many others, right? And that I am my feelings. And so they have a kind of living anthropology, whether they know it or not, like what they think, what is a human being? Maybe they haven't thought it through in different ways. And so um, I noticed in just looking at some of your material and hearing uh, you speak that St. John Paul II and the the great work he did had an impact in kind of forming your own understanding and teaching. Could you say something about that? What did you learn from him and and what are you, how are you applying it now? Yeah, I think I was really struck by, as many people are, you know, his, his Catholic personalism, right? The way that no matter what of his writings you're encountering, if it's his writings on sexuality, if it's his writings on Catholic social teaching, if it's his writings on life, it all keeps coming back to the dignity of the human person, right? The unique and unrepeatable dignity of every human being. Uh, And I think so often, I think it's easy 
um, not only to maybe look for our dignity someplace else, as you're mentioning, you know, whether that's in our feelings, whether that's in our insecurities, <laughs> you know, but I think even in other people, uh, to it's easy. I mean, I, I find this myself all the time. It's easy to make assumptions. Uh, it's easy to make judgments, but to really come back to that bedrock of um, the dignity of the human person, that that is really where um, our, our worth lies as being children of God and also really should be our primary motivating factor for how we're interacting with everybody that we encounter. Yeah. And uh, another common thing that people say is I'm just being true to myself. So like, and the true to myself is defined often by how I feel mm -hmm. back to my feelings are my ultimate reality. And so I want to be authentic and I want to, mm -hmm. you know, all those kinds of pieces. Now, how do you uh, how do you, in, in the organization, help people lay hold of what it, what is the truth about me, so to speak, right? Well, and actually, I think John Paul II is really valuable here, too, because I think one of the neat things about John Paul is I think he acknowledges and honors the subjective experience of the person and says, yeah, that is, there's a way that that's real, yeah. <laughs> right? But I think we need to hold both the ontological realities and those maybe more personal, subjective realities. That's a big word, ontological. Could you, some of our listeners might say, what, what did she just say? You know, what, what, do we mean, what do you mean by that? Right. We need to hold uh, the ontological, the order of being, like what is the, the objective reality, right? And so somehow, I think we really try to hold both of these things. At Eden Invitation, we say, okay, you need to accept, we need to accept our identity as a mago dei, right? Made in the image and likeness of God. This, this ontological reality that you have dignity, that you're created as a body, soul, unity, male or female. Um, you also need to accept kind of the shaping of your unique story, right? What's, what's happened in your life? What is it that you're experiencing? What are those longings of your heart? Where are those areas of disconnect, right? Those are real things. And I think I'm sure you've experienced this as well, that sometimes those places that feel like cracks or like fissures within ourselves, that's exactly the place that Christ wants to meet us. Yeah, it's very true. You know, and so where is it in these areas that that might feel challenging or we might feel a disconnect in our sexuality or in our bodies? And, and how does God want to meet us in that place uh, and invite us to a deeper love of him or seeing his love for us in a new way? Yeah, you mentioned we're, in so many words, you mentioned we're body persons. Mm -hmm. And that's part of understanding the truth about who we are. I know St. John Paul's teaching on the theology of the body, I think, has really helped a lot of people uh, in that area. But uh, you don't, we don't hear as much about the theology of the body right now in the life of the church in different ways. There's a different kind of focus going on. Mm -hmm. How much is that a part of your own teaching in the ministry and your own mm -hmm. awareness of helping people really come to uh, sort of a secure and clear understanding of who am I? When I ask the question, who am I? And what is the truth about me? What do I include in that? Mm -hmm. And does one part of me trump the other part of me, so to speak, in terms of... Right. Yeah, yeah I mean, I'm going to be a little bit of an egghead right now, but I yeah. <laughs> I think the first section of Man and Woman, He Created Them, is uh, is incredibly helpful, I think, for you know understanding the human person. And I think there's definitely... Um, I think one of our formation pillars is... Um, I just call it like original personhood, right? Like what does it mean to be a person and looking at these concepts that have been, you know, in church teaching for a very long time, right? These senses of, you know, original solitude, original integrity within the person, original unity between the sexes and original community in a way, right? That we're, we're intended for the, a human family. Um, and, uh, so that actually, that's pretty foundational on our website. We have a, called the four first things. Uh, and we, we use that in some of our retreats and some of our formation. But I think it's really, really essential to say, okay, what is God's intent um, for us as, as human beings and starting from that place? Yeah, very good. Let's talk a little bit more about the ministry. Why don't you break it open for us? What are the dimensions of what you do and how people can access it? And what's with the community, I'm particularly interested in the community dimension mm -hmm. of what you're developing. Yeah, you know, I think um, early on, I had a desire to, to write or to speak. But then, you know, myself and my co-founder were like, well, wait a minute. Once someone reads a blog, where do they go? Mm -hmm. What do they do? Uh, and the need for a place to, to process 
this, this stuff. And so uh, we started offering online small groups and it's grown from there. We now have in-person uh, chapters, essentially we call them hearth groups. Uh, we do retreats. Uh, we did a, a backpacking trip based with Theology of the Body teachings on it. Uh, and then in wider culture, you might think, does anyone else a lot of people have this experience, but does anyone else want to live church teaching? You know, and so you're kind of stuck in these places that could feel really isolating. And so we we really wanted to be able to bring people together. You know, it is not good for a man to be alone. Uh, mm -hmm. And so we wanted to bring people together to be around people who like got it, but we're also moving in the same direction. You know, I think a lot of people, um, if you're experiencing, you know, kind of deep seated same sex desires or you're really wrestling with your biological sex, some of the also traditional uh, vocational paths, um, state of life callings maybe aren't as clear, you know, like, uh, could I be a priest? Uh, am I am I called to marriage? Is that even a, a place I would thrive? Right. There's a lot of questions around that. And so I think it's extra important to be able to offer uh, opportunities for shared life with people who, um, again, are asking some of the same questions or might find themselves in a similar uh, state of life of dedicated singleness as well. How can uh, people interested connect with Eden? Uh, so you can find us, yeah, you can find us online, uh, edeninvitation.com. We also have uh, a social media platforms, Facebook, uh, Instagram, YouTube. Uh, but really the main thing is if you have an experience, if you have an experience of same-sex desires or gender discords and you want to talk to us, we offer a video call. You know, so if you reach out to us, we'll say, hey, let's set up a call and we'll receive your story and we'll talk with you. You won't just kind of receive an email and be done. <laughs> uh, but we want to get to know you. So feel free to reach out. Yeah. There's uh, probably some parents listening, some grandparents mm -hmm. listening who have a child, a grandchild who are wrestling with these very issues. And for them, a lot of times they're just confused, don't know what to do. They feel a certain pressure in the culture to say, what I should do is just simply affirm whatever they're saying, whatever they're feeling, I just need to do that. Because I, I don't want them to feel like I don't love them. I don't know what to do. And so it's a real struggle. What would you say to parents who are in that kind of a position? Yeah, I would say, you know, first of all, um, make sure that you are, as your child has shared with you, make sure that you're, thanking them for that vulnerability um, and you're affirming your love for them, right? As a human being um, and making sure that there is like that, that love and that welcome as a parent. I would also recommend just getting to know their experience and their story. You know, I've talked with some parents who maybe don't know what to do and so they just kind of shut down. Um, but I think it's important to ask questions about, well, you know, Tell me more about this experience. What has that been like for you? Because the more that you understand like the, the contours of that person's story, the more that you can ask the Holy Spirit to say, okay, God, where do you want me to speak into this situation? Where are you inviting me to invite them a little bit deeper? Um, and you're gonna have a much better sense of that, I think, with the Lord. Um, if you have a more complete understanding of what they're going through. Yeah, no, that's really very good. Now, there seems to be uh, more discordant voices in the church today, even on the leadership level, about this whole area of human sexuality. And there seems to be plates are shifting a little bit in different ways. Um, are you, number one, is that how you're experiencing it too? It, it, do you see it and hear it that way or not necessarily? Yeah, I mean, there's definitely a lot of different, there's a lot of different voices. You're starting to see maybe some advocates on a high level that the church should change teaching in certain ways. And yeah. it, it's a lot to, to parse. Are there places in the church where uh, you're encountering people, other people who are moving in a slightly different direction where they're in dialogue with one another? Or is that part of the picture? You know what I mean? Like, yeah, you know, I, I wish I could say I was seeing areas yeah. of dialogue and conversation, um, but I think so often it's somebody says something that goes on social media and then someone else responds on social media and then another news article happens and then eight more people respond on social media. I don't really see a lot of, hey, you know what, maybe we should have a nice round table. Let's fly everybody out and let's yeah. pray together and talk about these things. I, yeah. Yeah, that's not unfortunately, yeah, yeah. you know, but I, I think um, it is important to to be in dialogue with this with people, you know, right? Maybe you can't engage at the highest levels of the church. But if you're seeing these things that to be able to talk about this with, with people that, you know, I think all too often, maybe some of those discordant voices might be right in your parish, you know, or right in your group of friends. You know, yeah. it's not just, you know, bishops or high profile, whoever. Um, but some of those conversations, some of those, you know civil and uh, 
you know, honest conversations I think can happen yeah. right where you are in your community. Yeah. I know in any area of struggle or lack of integrity in life and, and the fundamental thing that, that helps us all come to a place of greater healing is deeper union with the Lord and um, being able to know his love, know his, uh, his grace, experience his power in the ministry. Um, what do you do? to help people form kind of a spiritual, their daily spiritual life and prayer and scripture and these kinds of things. Is there a part of what you do? Yeah. I mean, I think that's actually one of the most essential things um, because I just, I'm reminded a lot with this of, of John six, right? Like the saying is hard, who can accept it? And, and their only reason that Peter stays is because of relationship, right? He doesn't stay because he's like, oh yeah, I get transubstantiation. Right now, you don't know. He stays because of relationship. And so we, um, we're, we're always talking about prayer. We're encouraging prayer. All of our, um, all of our small groups and study guides come with, you know, prayer prompts. We've got time for personal and communal prayer on all of our retreats. And, um, even from our first calls with people, we're saying, you know, how, how's your conversation with God about this? Yeah. And you, you'd, you'd be surprised or maybe you wouldn't. How many people say, you know, I, I never thought to pray about this before. Maybe that's a good next step, you know, after this call um, is to open this part of your heart up to God and talk to him about it. Yeah, I think the there's a there's a fundamental reality that sometimes in these specific areas that people are struggling with, the focus can be on the particular struggle they're having. But the reality is the whole human, every human being is broken in some way. And that one of the things that could bring us together, and I think this is what it's beautiful about what you're doing is to say, you know, we're all following the same person and he's helping us understand who we are, that we have, we have a father and a loving father. I often think of St. Francis kneeling before the crucifix and he often, he'd ask two key questions often like, God, who are you and who am I? Hmm. You know, who am I? And, and that's essentially something we actually all do share in common in different ways. For some people it's more clear than other people, but helping each other all move in that direction is I think a critical piece to helping being able to help one another and have a certain sense of uh, common identity in pursuing the Lord. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the, it's, the, it's like at the posture of a disciple and disciples together, all weak and broken people, all of us. And we're all looking to the same place, right. To mm -hmm. be able to, to receive that grace, uh, really that grace from the Lord. How, how is the ministry expanding? Yeah, I mean, so I think it, it's interesting with our our ministry started online and we're transitioning to in-person. So it's kind of a reverse okay. COVID situation, maybe, <laughs> right? Where people flipped it the other way. And so, because really what we're seeing is there's such a desire for uh, incarnate community. People want shared life where they are. Uh, the internet's great. We have a very vibrant community forum, uh, but people again want shared life where they are. And so that's really a big area of focus for us is growing these hearth groups across the country and internationally uh, to be able to offer that, you know, in-person friendship really yeah. that people are looking for. Is your message getting out there pretty broadly? You know, yeah. I mean, there's um, been you know, great opportunities to, to connect with other folks in the church and uh, you, You'd be surprised how, you know, one person recommends and one person recommends and one person recommends and then ta-da, someone reaches out, you know? So uh, it's it's really beautiful. We're, we're in almost all the United, U.S. states. Mm. Uh, Montana, I think we're, we have nobody from Montana. So if, you, if you're experiencing this in Montana, you, you don't need to be alone. You can reach out. Yeah. Uh, and also several different uh, international countries as well. We're offering um, bilingual uh, programs now for um, Spanish-speaking people that reach out to us, and so we're we're seeing the need and and trying to respond. Is there, you come together annually. The hurt the the groups come together at different points in the year. Yep, yep. So we do uh, an annual retreat, uh, and then most of the other online programs, minus the small groups, are uh, are online. They're digital. So, um, have you written? Have you written a few books? Have you written anything about the topic? Or? You know, I, we've got some blogs and I do some speaking, but my primary role has also been just getting this organization going. So hopefully there'll be more of that in the future. But um, I've, yeah, we definitely have content that we create for um, people within the community as well. A lot of that's original, uh, original content that maybe one day we'll see the light of day for a general audience yeah, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is the... Um, 
the, the focus is on young adults and older, mm-hmm. not on high school age. Correct. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah. And if the, um, 18 and up, a- 18 and up. Okay. And out of high you school. You find it mostly in the twenties and thirties is, is what you're working with. We do. I mean, all ages right now connected. You know? Yeah. I mean, we've got probably age 19 to early fifties actually, which is great because you're starting to see some intergenerational. But I think what we tend to find is, um, people in their late twenties, because you, when you went to college and you had good community around you and then all your friends started getting married and then you thought, I probably need to deal with this. Yeah. <laughs> and then you reach out to eat an invitation. Yeah. We'll put it up on the screen, but would you like to tell Wonderful. our friends one more time how they can get a hold of you? Absolutely. Yeah. You can find us at eataninvitation.com slash community if it's your experience. Um, and then we also have a number of, re- if it's not your experience, um, we have a number of resources online. Uh, you can, and um, we're also a 51C3. So if you want to uh, share and support the mission, you can also find that on the website as well. And I want to thank you for your courageous leadership and all the life you bring to the church. This is, a, this is a critically important ministry. And for disciples whose hearts are alive to be able to gather others around the Lord so they can find identity in him and strengthen him. And it takes a lot of courage to do what you're doing. So thank you so much for it. Thank you so much, Peter. Friends, I'd like to offer you a new booklet I just, just wrote called Receiving Fire. Jesus said, I've come to cast fire upon the earth. Would that it were already ablaze. And what he's talking about is the, the fire of love that's burning in his heart the love of the Father and the Son, that he died to make it possible for you and me and all of us to come into that love. As we were talking, Anna and I, about the reality that every human person at some level is broken. And we're broken, why? Because we're not united to the love and the clear identity and the grace and the mercy of God, to knowing ourselves as children of God. And the Lord's poured out his Holy Spirit to help us become children of God, to make that possible and to give us the strength and capacity to live a new way of life. God bless you. So glad you could join us today. Hope to see you next week. Jesus said, I've come to cast fire on the earth, would that it were already ablaze. The Bible gives us a striking image of Jesus Christ in glory with eyes flaming fire, revealing a heart of burning love between God the Father and God the Son. It's that fire that Jesus wants to give to each and every one of us, a living flame of love and grace for those who receive it but it's also a fire of judgment for those who refuse it. In this short booklet, I wanna help you understand and to receive the fire Jesus desires to ignite in your heart. To receive a free copy, visit our website or call the number on the screen.